despite the fact that a portion of the Senate which had remained in Rome had elected Caesar dictator, giving him the authority to conveniently secure for himself the consulship, the portion of the Senate that followed Pompeius Magnus to Greece did not recognize Caesar's clumsy attempt to legitimize his treasonous march against Rome. Because it was the sacred duty of the consuls to oversee elections, and the 49 BC consuls, Gaius Claudius Marcellus and Lucius Cornelius Lentulus Crus, were away from Rome in Greece, those senators who had voted Caesar to the dictatorship were not taken seriously. Yet neither did the consuls have the authority to oversee elections from Greece. By Roman law, consular elections required the gathering of a centuriate assembly on Rome's campus Martius. With the campus Martius now under Caesar's control, the consulate, as well as the other governmental offices of 49 BC, were simply passed over, progressing instead to the next stage up the cursus honorum. Though we do not know what appointment was given to Gaius Claudius Marcellus, he ultimately journeyed to the island of Rhodes, where he was involved in leading a fleet for the Pompeian forces. Lucius Cornelius Lentulus Crus, laying down the powers of his consular office, journeyed to Asia. Once there, Lentulus Crus ordered that two legions from the area march to the aid of Pompeius Magnus in Macedonia. Pompeius had built his camp, and a large training area, approximately 37 miles west of Thessaloniki, for recruiting and conditioning a massive army that could take on Caesar. Pompeius fled Italy with five legions he had recruited there, then incorporated four more legions into his army after landing in Greece. Once he arrived in Macedonia, Pompeius added yet another legion of veterans collected from Crete, as well as a legion sent to him from the province of Cilicia. Pompeius's father-in-law, Metellus Scipio, became proconsul of Syria during the 49 BC year, where he levied a further two legions, which he marched towards Greece. Marcus Calpurnius Bibulus, following his 59 BC shared consulship with Caesar, did not take up a province after his ineffective term as consul, choosing instead to remain in Rome. In his ongoing opposition to Caesar, it was Bibulus who recommended that Pompeius Magnus, in lieu of being named dictator, be granted the unprecedented office of consul without a colleague, following the murder of Publius Clodius. As solo consul, Pompeius passed a law which required a five-year gap before a praetor or consul, after laying down his office, could take up a province to govern. With only a small pool of governors available, Bibulus, like Cicero, became one of the ex-consuls forced to take up a pro-consulship. Bibulus held Syria's pro-consulship from 51 BC, until relieved by Pompeius's father-in-law, Metellus Scipio. Bibulus arrived in Syria after Cicero's term as pro-consul of Cilicia had ended. During Cicero's time in the east, he had helped Syria's acting pro-quester, Gaius Cassius Longinus, in bringing some stability to Syria, by repelling the ongoing attacks from Parthia which followed the death of Marcus Licinius Crassus. But after participating in only a few minor skirmishes against Parthian raiders, Marcus Calpurnius Bibulus wrote to the Senate claiming victory for having settled Syria. In response, the Senate, as it had done for Caesar following the Battle of Elysia, voted 20 days of thanksgiving in the name of Marcus Calpurnius Bibulus, despite the fact that Parthia was neither defeated in battle, nor had it ceased being a threat to Roman Syria. In Egypt, the death of King Ptolemy Auletes in early 51 BC, saw his daughter, Cleopatra VII, and his son, Ptolemy XIII, jointly ascend the throne. The garrison of soldiers, called the Gabiniani, which had been stationed in Egypt by Aulus Gabinius to ensure Ptolemy Auletes remained on his throne, were now unemployed. With famine in the land, a general lawlessness arose, instigated by the now defunct Gabiniani. Upon learning of the unrest, Bibulus sent his two eldest sons to Egypt to negotiate with the Gabiniani, and attempt to enlist them in defending Syria against Parthian invasion. Unfortunately, the Gabiniani captured Bibulus's two sons, and then tortured him to death. Having caught the Gabiniani ringleaders, Queen Cleopatra sent him to Bibulus in Antioch. Marcus Calpurnius Bibulus, despite his great pain at having lost his sons, and in such a horrific manner, at the hands of Romans no less, returned the culprits to her in Egypt, also delivering to Cleopatra a harsh criticism for interfering with Roman adjudication, which was the prerogative of the Senate. 
Following his term as governor of Syria, Bibulus took command of one of Pompeius Magnus's fleets, with orders to blockade naval passage from Brundisium to Greece. With legions already in hand from Italy, Greece, Cilicia, Crete, Macedonia, Asia, and Syria, Pompeius also sent out dispatches to his client kings and rulers in Egypt, Greater Armenia, Comagene, Pontus, Cappadocia, and Galatia, requesting they also contribute forces, which each kingdom answered by sending troops to Pompeius. And though Caesar had successfully taken Hispania, securing also the regions of Cisalpine Gaul, Transalpine Gaul, Italy, Corsica, and Sicily for the Caesareans, the balance of the war looked to favour Pompeius Magnus. Caesar had experienced setbacks. Not only were there rumours that his 9th legion mutinied, but his lieutenant, Gaius Scribonius Curio, had failed to take Africa, and take control of its grain supply. And though Curio had succeeded in securing Sicily's grain supply from Cato, it wasn't nearly enough to feed all Italy, let alone Caesar's many, many legions. Setting up a blockade of the Adriatic Sea, Pompeius trapped Caesar in Italy, waiting and hoping for starvation to turn the people against Caesar. Marcus Antonius's brother, Gaius Antonius, attempted to break through the blockade, and marshal Caesar's newly enlisted 24th and 28th legions into Illyricum, where he was to regain several cities which had been taken by the Pompeians, giving them control over the land route into Greece. Gaius Antonius's forces, however, were intercepted by the Pompeian fleet. Left blockaded on a small island off the coast, a centurion in the ranks of Antonius's army, named Titus Pullo, once praised by Caesar for his bravery in Gaul, now instigated mutiny. Abandoning Gaius Antonius, Titus Pullo led the 24th and 28th legions to defect from Caesar, before marching him into the service of Pompeius in Greece. Because Pompeius had gathered to himself such a massive host, securing for the Pompeians everything around the Mediterranean, from Africa to Illyricum, many who had stayed in Rome, remaining neutral, now saw the handwriting on the wall. Pompeius Magnus would win Rome's civil war, and then Rome would be under his military dictatorship. So that they might demonstrate their support of the upcoming dictator in advance of his actual win those who had previously chosen neutrality suddenly threw their support behind Pompeius Magnus. They evacuated Italy, travelling to Macedonia, where they joined him and Rome's true senate. At the end of December of the 49 BC year, Marcus Calpurnius Bibulus, whose blockade of Brundisium had prevented Caesar's forces from leaving Italy, laid up his fleet in Winter Harbour on the island of Corfu, leaving only a small reconnaissance force on the water. Winter crossings were extremely dangerous, and Roman war vessels, large and cumbersome, were subject to shipwreck given the sea's unpredictable storms. Generals did not cross the sea during winter. But, on January 4 of 48 BC, Julius Caesar, leading seven of his legions, risked what Bibulus deemed unthinkable. He crossed the Adriatic Sea, landing in Greece near the town of Oricum. Setting up an immediate beachhead camp, Caesar sent his fleet of ships back across the Adriatic to pick up the remaining five legions, and supplies, that waited in Brundisium under the command of Marcus Antonius. However, by the time Caesar's empty ships set sail, Bibulus learned of his crossing. Commanding his fleet back into the waters, Bibulus renewed his blockade of Brundisium, and successfully sank 30 of Caesar's vessels on their return journey. With only seven of his twelve legions, and no supply wagons to feed his army, Caesar was now isolated. Unable to return to Italy, and in no position to take on the more than seventeen legions who had flocked to the standards of Pompeius Magnus, Caesar immediately took the town of Oricum, and then moved up the coastline to the town of Apollonia. From there, Caesar sent an emissary to the camp of Pompeius Magnus, offering terms of mutual disarmament and mutual submission to the people of Rome for punitive adjudication. However, when the emissary, a Pompeian, twice captured by Caesar in Italy, reached Pompeius Magnus, he merely reported the details of Caesar's weakened and vulnerable position. Caesar had placed himself within the grasp of Pompeius Magnus. Pompeius had only to stretch out his hand, and victory over Caesar was his.